Um, so our final speaker, Professor Helen Christensen, is coming to us from Australia. So she's in the other end of the very early time in the morning for her. Um, she's director of the chief, she's director and chief scientist at the Black Dog Institute and professor of mental health at UNSW. She is chief investigator for the Center for Research Excellence in Suicide Prevention at the National Health and Medical Research Council, or NHMRC. Elizabeth Blackman Fellow in Public Health and previ previously one of only two NHMRC John Cade Research Fellows. She's also on the Million Minds Panel, a government initiative that has brought together the most distinguished academics and mental health professionals to reduce the prevalence of mental health and suicide. Professor, Christ Professor Christensen is a leading expert on using technology to deliver evidence-based interventions for the prevention and treatment of depression, anxiety, suicide, and self-harm. Her research also encompasses prevention of mental health problems in young people through school-based research programs. These programs are aimed at prevention of depression and suicide risk through e-mental health interventions. We're so glad that you can join us today and I will now let you have the virtual stage. Thank you very much, Mona, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm really not sure I'm talking about the right thing. I think I'm a mixture between Obi, Shekhar, and uh, all speakers actually. So what I'm talking about today is using AI and sensor technology to improve mental health. Um, I'm from the Black Dog Institute, which is uh, located in uh, Sydney, Australia. And first of all, I'd like to acknowledge a number of people who've helped with this research in particular, uh, Dr. Kit Huckvale, uh, Dr. Aliza werner Seidler, and Kate Marston, who have been running the Future Proofing project that I'll be talking about today. So, I think all the speakers have talked about the fact that there are huge gaps in managing mental health disorders. Um, there's problems with knowing what the nature of these disorders are, lack of access, um, long waiting lists, poor tools and non-optimal treatments. And as we know, during COVID, at least in Australia, 75% of young people are experiencing psychological distress. And some people are developing mental health problems for the first time. So we really do have a problem here that requires scale. So differently framed, I see these three massive, these are three massive issues in mental health currently. The first is how you um, predict mental health problems um, when people don't even know they perhaps have a mental health problem and when we really find it very hard to predict in ourselves what might be coming next. The second problem is what treatments um, can we use for whom and when? How do we deliver mental health treatments the right way and to the right people? And finally, how you deliver them in scale. And we've heard about India and the Harvard School and Empower and all these things. Basically, technology helps you uh, scale. So these issues are very hard, but there has been a view that centre technologies on phones and the use of AI in helping might help us in this pursuit to be able to make these challenges easier. So really what I'm going to be talking about today is the use of sensors that may improve detection and the use of AI processes to improve treatments, what works for whom and where. So uh, just to briefly explain where I'm coming from, we started probably you know, six or seven years ago with this model of detect and deliver. Detect a mental health problem, deliver an app-based intervention straight away. And I think we were pretty naive, and I think everybody really is in this space still, but the idea that you could pick up some particular single indicator that somehow was gonna trigger off, you know, here you go, here's your app and you're fixed. Um, and I think probably we've got a lot more humble and learning a lot more now in the last few years. And we're trying now to introduce more robust collection platforms to do partnerships for AI and try and measure digital signals from smartphones. So we've kind of added in this extra bit that um, we hope will make our quest more uh, sophisticated, but also maybe deliver something in the end. So what are we talking about when we're talking about sensor detectors? And there's different ways, and Obi's already talked about digital phenotyping, but Essentially, you want a signal that produces something useful in terms of your output. And the way we've been looking at it, we've collected, um, if you like, uh, passive data collection, location, device usage, you know, how people use their phone, and any connection to healthcare. And then we move into more active sensing, like movement, voice samples, which we collect and analyze, and then continuous assessment, including things like cognition, 
and uh, self-report um, directly and also through EMA. And the idea basically is to try and develop contextual triggers uh, within tailored and adaptive e-health interventions. So that's really the goal. Um, and on the other end, in the deliver end, over the last few years, we've been developing a huge range of evidence-based tools. So these are in different age groups, they're for schools, primary care settings, workplaces. And what we try and do with these apps or platforms is actually compare them like you might, you might a medication to a placebo so that we actually have, you know, uh, gold standard evidence, if you like, that these particular apps are not going to, that uh, uh, potentially can help. And we do know that these properly administered through proper trials and so on have pretty good effect sizes and can do as well as face-to-face. -face. So there's no doubt that the potential is there. So I'm going to talk today really just about two projects. If I have time, I'll talk about a third one, which links into the HEROES project that OB is doing as well, because we developed an app for mental health professionals or frontline workers during COVID. But I'll start with the future proofing uh, project and then go on to our optimised project. Um, so the future proofing, um, oh, sorry, let me see here, right. The future proofing project essentially is a study in schools. We conducted, started last year, it's been interrupted, but we're back in the field again and we've nearly got um, 2,000 young people uh, through the project. So it's a pragmatic e-health prevention, randomised controlled trial for adolescents. Uh, 20,000 we're recruiting to the trial and half of them will get an intervention and half not. We're doing the digital phenotyping enabled by our platform and we're exploring digital predictors and mood. So we have a gamified engagement sensing as well as active sensing. Um, our intervention design essentially, I won't go through this, but essentially young people when they're going through school, it's a case of a large number of them or a significant number of them develop mental health problems within this envelope of time. And so what we're trying to do is compare the control condition here where we expect a higher rate in the number of people developing mental health disorders. What we want to do is shave that down as in the blue curve there. Uh, so it's a prevention trial um, and what we want to do is prevent the incidence of depression. I won't go into the second intervention. There is a second intervention in the middle. Uh, what we're doing for our intervention is basically CBT, and this is a program called SPARKS that we modified and turned into a preventative intervention. It was developed by um, Sally Mary at the University of Auckland and her team, and we've turned it into uh, a mobile app, which we, we've already pre-tested and found to be effective in schools. Now, this is our digital install platform where we collect all the data. So as you can see, as I already described, we get location movement, user activity, self-reports, and we also have a digital treatment. And it's all on one app and it gets downloaded onto the kids' phones while they're in school. Uh, and this is kind of an example of the location phenotyping that we can do where we find that, for example, in this case, this kid has two homes, first home, second home, he goes to the school and um, school sports facility, um, which is this established routine. But at weekends, we find that there's a different pattern in how he behaves and so on. So you can develop this quite sophisticated. And there's a lot of data. Anyone who's done this, it's just awesome, the amount of data that you have to be able to take in before you even can do anything with it. So it's uh, quite a technology feat to uh, collect all this data on these number of people. So um, I have a bit of a spoiler here. I can't tell you whether this program is going to make a difference or not because we haven't done the um, 10,000 people through the trial yet, but we hope to do that very soon. Um, but I can tell you that we have learned a few lessons that might be useful, I guess, to others going forward. Um, the first is that people really talk about how easy it is to collect passive data. And I would say the first thing we've learned is the myth of effortless data capture needs to be squashed. It's really hard to get this data from the, um, in real life, in the wild, from young people, any people. Um, 
So our experience uh, shows that you need to incentivize or provide something back to the people in order to have them engage with the data. Um, and this can be by engagement, reward, interventions, um, gamified kind of testing. Um, and if all else fails, structuring the environment so that people are compelled to complete the tasks. That is, we keep the kids in the school and make sure that we do the best to capture as much data as we can before they get out. Um, the second thing we learned is that one indicator is not going to make a difference, and that's why we're trying to combine all of these data sets together with our miraculous machine learning people to see if there's something meaningful in how you put these data sets these sets of data together and we think that that will be critical um, and of course we need to validate these data again using machine learning to understand what the signal is giving us and in this study we're really very lucky because we've got self-report we've got linkage data to healthcare services and we've got educational outputs so we've got this this some pretty good indicators about whether we're actually going to be able to um, develop a robust signal. And I'd also say that we spend a lot of time collecting these, these data from people. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that some of these signals are real. You know, they don't need to be pre-processed, if you like, things like uh, cognitive performance and what we know about that and depression. But others need to be actually used and modified and changed and used in with other signals. I'd also say that we've got longitudinal data, which has been absent pretty much from a lot of this digital phenotyping. And obviously, you need to look at intra-individual change. Um, so we like our sensor data to be linked as well to in some theoretical way, whether it's speed of processing or something else, to um, a theoretical concept. Anyway, we look forward to sharing the data with you. I think we're collecting enough data. I mean, we're getting around about 60 or 70% of kids donating various types of data because they can opt in. Uh, but we're not getting 100% of this data on all the people going through um, the program. So the second study I wanted to just briefly talk about that we're doing is one where we're look, trying to improve um, the type of treatment. Now, this is something that the Wellcome Trust is really interested in, which is what treatments work for whom? We know we've got some okay treatments. Some people seem to do much better than some others. And, and I'm talking here about behavioural treatments. So can we use AI somehow to fasten up the process to see how well people are responding to a particular treatment? Um, and so we're doing this study. We've just been funded for it, which is in students, uh, essentially um, they have to have some degree of psychological Distress, they're randomised sequentially to one of three two-week self-guided app-based uh, interventions or in an active control. Um, those are mindfulness, physical activity or sleep hygiene. We're looking at pre-post trial. But I guess the point about why we're doing this is that with our install platform, we've now plugged in the intervention models, which are all internet interventions, which means you can really cut and paste and stick them in and do a whole range of these kind of two-week mini trials in order to see which uh, reacts and how they react. And, of course, we've got our AI people, our machine learning modules, and our, also our AI-driven optimization, which is what we're trying to do to make it more efficient. So I'll skip to that, which kind of this is what happens. People come into the trial, they get randomised to one of these four conditions in pink. I'm sorry I'm going so fast here. Then we do a post-survey at that two-week period and determine which of these particular treatments are working the best in that short period of time. Uh, and then we use a particular algorithm to feed back into our randomization program in order to maximise two things, I guess, which we're trying to solve simultaneously. So we're trying to find the best intervention, effect size, and we're also trying to minimise people allocated to ineffective interventions. So the number of people going into these different interventions changes as a result of every two, uh, of a period of two weeks. So very excited about this. Hopefully it'll work and we'll see and we'll save I guess the thing is that 
we will save time, we will save energy, and we will be getting results faster to help people. We're also looking at the individual characteristics of people in order to put that into this particular algorithm as well so that we can say who works for what. Um, so the lessons we've learned from Optimize, well, I basically say not too much yet um, because we've just really started, but it is quite an interesting process to think about how we can improve uh, our trial methodology as well as improve the treatments um, that we're getting from people. So um, just I'm pretty much going to stop there, I think, and just sum up really um, to say that, um, it, you know, I started this talk with three big issues, um, better ways to detect mental ill health, better ways to personalise treatment and how to scale through technology. Um, we're on a journey here. It's a very exciting way to go and it's obviously that we're what we are doing that probably differs from other groups, I'd say, is trying to do this at the scale that you need to be able to make the most of the AI and the sensor data that you're collecting and collecting at longitudinally. So um, I, I briefly described our trials and the lessons learned. And I'm just giving a heads up here that we also tried to develop an app, <laughs> which we did in a short period of time. I, I'm sure our resources were not as wonderful as yours, Obi, but um, we, this particular app does track, um, at, enga engages people with self-help, evidence-based interventions, and it also allows them to network into um, forums, find psychiatrists, find psychologists, find some other people they want. And ultimately, at one point, you can actually opt in to a telehealth uh, measure with our psychiatrists, psychologists, and so on. Um, but what we're finding with mental health professionals and frontline workers, I have to say, is that they, they like anonymity, they don't want to ever speak to anyone really, and they like to empower themselves. So our initial model is currently being pivoted and it'd be great to speak about that as well. So um, here's, here it is if you want to go to it on the website. So thank you very much.